Good morning. What a great day it is to be in the Lord's house. And I know that this week we have celebrated a beautiful and a wonderful time that we were allowed to uh, give thanks to God just for the many blessings through Thanksgiving and for the many, many things that God has gifted us with and uh, just the blessings of health and uh, family and friends. And so we are so thankful for that. And so we are so honored that you are here with us today to worship and to give, continue to give thanks to who God really is. So this morning, let's all stand together as we begin our time of worship. Remember that worship is not just something that we do physically. It's not just something just singing or just um, speaking or reading our scriptures even. Worship is something that we truly feel through the heart. And so I pray that this morning we don't get wrapped up in the emotions of it, but that we allow ourselves to truly worship God. I will enter his gates with thanksgiving in my heart. I will enter his courts with praise. I will say this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. He has made me glad. He has made me glad. I will rejoice for he has made me glad. Rejoice for he has made me glad. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. We bring the sacrifice of praise into the house of the Lord. And we offer up to you the sacrifice. Thirteen fifteen says, let us continually offer up to God a sacrifice of praise. You may be seated this morning. Well, good morning. I hope that you had a happy Thanksgiving. I know that I did, but I tell you what, I'm thankful for a lot of things, and you guys are at the top of my list. I'm thankful to be here to worship with you today. Sunday is my favorite day out of the week, and I hope that you enjoy gathering together as a body of believers and praising the good Lord together. I hope that you don't take that for granted and that you are thankful for that. If you're a guest visiting with us today, we're glad that you chose to worship with us. Feel free to stop by our beautiful uh, welcome booth in the foyer after service today. We'd love to talk to you about ways that you can get involved, ways that you can plug in here at Fredonia Baptist Church. Uh, be reminded that today is the last day to buy donuts uh, for the Journey Winter Retreat Weekend Fundraiser. They have to turn in their money to me today. So if you would like some donuts, if you'd like to support those who are going to camp, today is the last day to do so. If you would like to buy some, you can see me, and I will point you in the right direction. Today is the deadline to sign up for the Women's Christmas Craft event on December the 4th. The cost is uh, $40. Is that right? That looks like a typo. 
20, I'm sorry, it's $20. I knew that was not right. Please pay Miss Leslie Randall today. There's a sign-up list on the bulletin board. There's more information about that in the bulletin if that is something that interests you. Uh, Angel Tree Ministry, there are two ways that you can give to Angel Tree this year. You can give to the month of missions, which is this month. That is Angel Tree. So far, I think we've raised about $350, and we need a minimum of $1,000 to provide groceries for all of the families that we're trying to feed this year. We're trying to buy groceries for 16 different families for the holidays, and we need at least $1,000. So if you would like to give, please do so today. Today is the last day that you can do that. Another way that you can give is you can also buy gifts for an angel from the angel tree that is in the foyer. You can just write your name on the form that's on the table beside the angel number that you pick, and you can return your gifts unwrapped and labeled uh, with that angel number on the gift. The deadline to return those gifts is December 11th, because on December 11th, at 5 o'clock, we're going to have an angel tree pack and party. We'll meet in the Family Life Center, which is the big metal building directly behind me. We're going to pack grocery boxes. We're going to make uh, homemade cards. We're going to wrap presents and do all a bunch of other stuff. It's a lot of fun. Uh, we did this last year for the first time, I think, and it was really a blast. You can involve your young kids in it all the way up to however old uh, you claim to be. It's for all ages. You can get involved. I hope that you make plans to bring your family and be involved in that family ministry opportunity. Reminder, that is on December 11th on a Sunday night at 5 o'clock in the Family Life Center. Youth Bible Drill material is ready. If you'd like to pick it up, you can see Miss Shelley McClellan or you can see uh, Miss Mary Wages. On December the 14th, we're going to have our children's and youth Christmas parties. For the youth Christmas party, you'll need to bring a $10 Dirty Santa gift. If you have any questions about that, you can talk to me. Now, November is full of a lot of special occasions. Uh, we had rivalry week in college football yesterday. We have Thanksgiving. We have Black Friday shopping, if you're into that. But November is actually also National Adoption Awareness Month. And we actually have a video that we want you to watch. And after we watch the video, uh, Miss Victoria Vaughn is going to come up and share with us a little bit about their adoption experience. You guys watch this video. Our adoption journey began early on in our marriage. We, we got married uh, the summer between my sophomore and junior year in college. And uh, our first child was born 10 months later. So people thought we were crazy. Our second child wasn't born until um, a couple of years later. And uh, after that, we had a girl and a boy. And we heard it over and over and over again. You know, you have the perfect little family. And there was so much pressure on us um, to just stop there. But then a few years later, we wanted more children and um, had done some things to prevent us from having children. And we went back and found out that those things could not be reversed. So um, we began to, at that point, think about adoption. So here we are with our 11-year-old and our 14-year-old. And we walk into this agency and we said, hey, we're interested in adopting. Um, and I, I think we said that we were interested in adopting several children. And the lady just went and got her supervisor. We, we didn't, you know, know what was going on. She said, tell her what you just told me. And we just, you know, we're interested in adopting maybe a, a few children. That you, you just, um, we didn't know at the time that adoption agencies in this country um, have a hard time finding black families who um, who will adopt. It was like an answer to prayer for them. We started our paperwork in May, and we were matched in July. It was almost scary because we were just, you know, sort of getting used to the idea. Mm -hmm. By the end of July, there was another baby in our home. Yeah, that was our first of seven adoptions, and everything changed. We never went through that process again. The second adoption was with the same agency. The adoptions three through seven, we just got phone calls. Seven times, the Lord said yes. It's been incredible for us. We, we love every minute of it. Um, we laugh a lot. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of work to be done but everybody pitches in and, and it's great. For me, adoption has helped me both as an, an individual Christian and as a pastor. 
until, you know, I became a father to adopted children and was able to look at my children and know these are as much my children as those children who are related to me biologically. Uh, until that moment, I wasn't able to fully just understand and grasp what it means to be a child of God because we are his children by adoption. When you understand adoption, you get that. No, we are his children. And he's not going anywhere. Adoption is about the gospel. For me, adoption is important because it's just a beautiful picture of God's grace in my life. I was really the forerunner in doing something to prevent us having more children biologically. I was in sin, I was wrong. Um, I wanted to be in control and I didn't allow God to be in control. God is so faithful to give us back what the locust have eaten. I just get a chance to love on some kids who are actually my kids and raise them. It's just been a blessing. I did not think that I would be almost 50 years old with seven kids, seven little kids. But I tell you, I wouldn't trade this for anything. When we started this journey, um, we, we were on the downhill side of parenting. Yep. You know, we had two kids, they were 14 and 11. We were just a few years away from an empty nest. And now we're, we're you know, almost 50. And, you know, we're looking at 10, 8, Six, five, four, three, and almost, almost two. two. <laughs> um, you know, so no, we're 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 not doing the empty nest thing. But what else are we gonna do? What else are we gonna do in our lives that would be more important than what we're doing right now with our lives? I, I can't think of anything. John need a minute to recover after that video. Um, adoption is obviously deeply personal to me and is one of those passions that I think God has ingrained in me even before Jeremy and I were married. And I don't know if y'all remember this, but it was actually five years ago this month that Jeremy and I stood on this stage and announced that we were adopting our oldest son, Tanner. It's crazy. <laughs> Five years. And I just want to start by saying thank you. This church family surrounded us with support and with prayer as we prepared to go to Thailand and get Tanner. And then when we came home, y'all continued to love on us and love on our son and provide us the support that we needed during our adoption journey. So thank you so much for doing what God commands, which is seeking justice, caring for and lifting up the orphans. This is a command that is found throughout scripture on the back of our t-shirts that we sold to actually fundraise for our adoption of Tanner with Psalms 82.3, which says, provide justice for the needy and the fatherless, uphold the rights of the oppressed. And the destitute. Another one of my favorite verses on adoption is found in James. It's James 1, 27. Pure and undefiled religion before our God and Father is this, to look after orphans and widows in their distress and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Reading scripture, it's clear to me that if you're a Christian, you are called to lift up the orphans, to care for the orphans. I'm not gonna say you're called to adopt, but I would encourage you, and I'm gonna be very transparent here, this is something I'm even praying for myself. What would you have me do? God, am, am I done? Have I done all you've asked me to, to support the orphans? 
in our community, in our world, or are you asking more? When we were driving home from Gatlinburg, I was listening, we were listening to praise music, and one of the th- songs that came on was by Lauren Daigle, and it's The Rescue. And the chorus is, I will send out an army to find you in the middle of the darkest night. I will rescue you. And God just spoke to me. There are orphans in this community, in this state, in this country, in this world. There are kids that are going to wake up Christmas morning without a family. They're going to wake up in foster care. They're going to wake up in orphanages. And I want to encourage you, is God asking you to do something about it? Is God asking you to provide a family? I don't know. Is God asking you to support a family that you know that's pursuing adoption? Is God asking you to get on your knees and to pray for families, for support for families? I don't know. But I want you to know that I am here. I'm here to talk to you, to pray for you. If you're questioning, if you're seeking, if you want more information, please come and find me. I would love to pray for you and encourage you in whatever that journey may look like. And please remember that we are that army that God is calling to seek out and to lift up the fatherless. Thank you. And I think that's also a great reminder to understand that if you're a believer in Christ, you have been adopted by God the Father. We have been adopted into his family. We can call him Father, and he calls us his child. And I think that's a great reminder as we worship today to remember that he has called you, he has adopted you, and you are a part of his family. And what a great opportunity that we have to worship him, to be in fellowship with one another as children of God, and to be in fellowship with him as well. If you would, let's bow our heads and pray together as we continue with our service this morning. Father, we're thankful for who you are. Lord, we're thankful that you do adopt us, that, Lord, um, you send your son to, to suffer the punishment for our sins, Lord, that you pay a debt that we could not pay. You pay it yourself. And, Lord, that allows us to become adopted by you through your grace, through your mercy. Lord, we're able to be called your children. We're able to call you Father. We're able to call you Abba. Lord, I pray that we remember that today as we sing to you, that we'll just sing. Lord, we'll have hearts full of thankfulness and full of adoration for you and and for who you are and how you love us. Lord, unconditionally, in a perfect love, no matter the mistakes that we make, no matter how we mess up, no matter the sins that that we commit or the ones that we'll commit in the future, Lord, you knew every single mistake and flaw that I would ever make. Lord, when you got on the cross and you didn't change your mind and you won't. So, Lord, I pray that we remember that as we sing today, as we open up your word. Lord, that we'll just have thankful hearts. And, Lord, we'll remember that we are yours by adoption. Lord, I pray that, um, that you'll press upon the hearts of those uh, who may be considering adoption, who may be considering supporting um, the orphans. And, and, Lord, I just pray that you will give them a clear, direct answer um, as to how you are to use them. Lord, I pray that you'll give us a heart of submission, a heart of understanding that you're in control, and Lord, that we'll just ask the question, Lord, what would you have us do? What would you have us do with our lives? Lord, I pray that as we sing to you today, that you'll be glorified. Lord, I pray for those who are sick, as a lot of sickness is going around. I pray for those who are hurting. Lord, you are our comforter. Lord, you are our healer. Lord, I pray that we remember that as we sing to you, as we open up your word today. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for adopting us. Lord, I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Based out of scriptures found in Colossians 2 and 3, it says, Above all, put on love, the perfect bond of unity, and let the peace of the Messiah, to which you were also called in one body, control your hearts. And be thankful. Let the message about the Messiah dwell richly among you, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, and singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. And so today and every day of the year, whether it's Thanksgiving Day or whatever 
day it may be, I pray that we come to God with a thankful heart. He tells us through Scripture many, many times to find gratitude in who He is and to be thankful. Um, and so today, I want to challenge you. Um, don't let it just happen at Thanksgiving or even just at Christmas time that we take that opportunity to tell God how appreciative we are of Him, how thankful we are to Him, and how grateful we are for His blessings too. But this morning, let's all stand together as we continue our time of worship. Psalm 71, 23 says, My lips will shout for joy when I sing praise to you. So this morning, let's lift up the joy of the Lord as we continue through singing. Joyful, joyful. Pray that we can give thanks through the good times, through the bad times, and through the in-between times as well. This morning, you may be seated.
give you thanks. Father, for all the many ways you have blessed us, God, help us to always be reminded of that. God, the fact that we're so undeserving, God, we don't deserve your mercy, your grace, yet it's, it's new every morning just as there's dew on the ground each and every morning that we wake up. And so, Father, help us to be reminded of that. God, help us to be found in that. God, your love. God, found in the gospel of your grace. And God, help us, God, to share that with others. God, to allow that to penetrate our hearts in such a way, God, that we would live that out and that we would look for opportunities to share that message of hope with others. And God, help us to, to look at your text now, God, your word as, as guidance and as words of, of wisdom and instruction, Father, for how we are to live our lives. And God, how we are to be thankful for the lives that you have given us through your son, Jesus Christ. And so, God, may I be able to proclaim that in a way that would be true to your text, true to your word. And God, I pray that your word would do the work this morning. God, that it would pierce our hearts. God, that it would pierce our minds. God, that it would challenge us and encourage us and inspire us and equip us to be the people of God that you've called us to be. God, I say these things and ask these things in your son's name, Jesus' name. Amen. In 2014, the world was shocked. Maybe you remember, the, the world was shocked by the sudden passing, passing of Robin Williams. I'm sure you remember Robin Williams was a beloved actor. He was a comedian. It seemed impossible that a person like him who could make anyone laugh, make anyone smile, could be so unhappy and so depressed that he would end up taking his own life. I mean, if there was ever anyone that you would come across as being happy, it was him, right? Robin Williams. He had an infectious smile. Uh, he was incredibly funny. It seemed as if he lived a picture-perfect life. And yet, just as you know and I know, it was later revealed that Robin Williams battled depression. And it was later discovered that while he could make anyone smile and, and be happy, he oftentimes found himself being so unhappy to the point that he took his own life. And what a tragic thing that was. Let me ask you a very personal question this morning. Are you happy with your life? Are you happy with the life that you've been given? Are, are, are you satisfied with it? Are, are, are you content in the life God has given you? Do you find true, genuine, lasting joy in your life? For some of you here this morning, maybe you say, Jeremy, if I'm being honest, I've never been totally happy. And I can put on, a, put on a face, I can smile, but, but really I've never experienced that in the way that you just described. Or for others of you, maybe, maybe you say that you resonate with Robin Williams. Maybe you say, I, I, I too, I battle with depression, with anxiety, anxious thoughts. I, I, I struggle with those things in my mind. Or, or maybe you're, you, you describe your life as just a, a never-ending roller coaster. And some days are, are good days. Some days you find yourself being happy and joyful. But then there are other days where you feel so unsatisfied, so discontent, so displeased with your life. Let me ask it a different way. If life didn't change at all from you, from, from this moment forward, would you still be happy with your life? If your career didn't improve, if, if your marital status didn't change, if your career didn't progress, if your body didn't feel any better, could you still be happy? Could you still be, despite those things, satisfied with the life God has gifted you? See, we are entering into a season of the year that is meant to make us smile. 
It's meant to make us happy. We gather together with friends and family for Thanksgiving. We decorate our homes for Christmas. We buy each other gifts. We celebrate the holidays with our families and loved ones. And I surely hope that brings a smile to your face and brings joy to your life. My question for you, though, is this. When the friends and family leave... When the presents have been opened, when the gatherings have come to a close, will you still be happy with your life? That when you're all alone or or when you lay your head down at night, do you wonder why you're not happy? Do those thoughts cross through your mind? Do, Do you wonder why life seems to never satisfy you? Even though you know you've been blessed by God, do you find meaning and purpose, and value, and joy in life, or do those things seem to escape you? And you're left wondering why. Why am I unhappy? Why am I unsatisfied with life? If you have your Bible, I want you to open it to the book of Psalms. And I want us to look at the very first Psalm, Psalm chapter 1. So turn your Bible there. Psalm chapter 1. And today I want us to seek to answer that, old, that, that age-old question of why am I not happy? Why am I not happy? I believe that the answer to that question, as difficult as it is, as loaded as it is, I believe the answer is found in Psalm chapter 1. In fact, the book of Psalms, which by the way is made up of 150 different Psalms, but it opens with the word happy. Look at Psalm 1, verse 1. It says, how what? How happy is the one. That's what this psalm is all about. It's about being happy, being satisfied, feeling fulfilled, feeling blessed with the life God has has given you and has gifted you. Right now, I've heard it said before, I've heard it said before that when you're young, when you're young, you think happiness is inevitable. Right? You, you, you think that you're going to find that special someone. You, you think that you're going to get that high-paying job if you just work hard in school. You think you're going to build that beautiful family. And that if you're just patient, happiness is just around the corner waiting for you. However, by the time that you're grown up and you're old, happiness is inevitable, has been replaced with happiness is unattainable. In other words, you got that special someone. You got that high-paying job. You built that beautiful family, but there is still an empty void in your life, and you still find yourself unhappy. Well, the Bible says happiness is neither, neither inevitable nor unattainable, but it does say it's possible. And I want us to look at Psalm 1 for clarity. Let's look, read it in whole now. It says, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, or stand in the pathway with sinners, or sit in the company of mockers. Instead, his delight is in the Lord's instruction, and he meditates on it day and night. And he is like a tree planted beside flowing streams that bears its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. Whatever he does prospers. The wicked are not like this. Instead, they are like chaff that the wind blows away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand up in the judgment nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. For the Lord watches over the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked leads to ruin. Psalm 1 contrasts the godly with the ungodly. The psalmist psalmist says that those who walk with God, as you see in your text, they're like trees with deep roots beside streams of water who bear much fruit, who are prosperous in all they do. And the psalmist says that the ungodly, by contrast, are like chaff. Chaff is the, is the shell that surrounds a wheat seed in its very light. In those, in those days, you would, put, you would put the wheat in a basket and you would throw it up and the wind would take away the chaff, it would just blow it away in the wind. And that's what he's talking about here, this great contrast. And the reason that he uses this metaphor is to show us Why those who know God and walk with God can be happy in a way those who don't cannot. Okay, to explain this, the psalmist identifies two things that people usually look to to make them feel happy, but in all actuality won't satisfy those needs. 
Okay, the first one that he identifies is circumstances. And so if you're taking notes, then write down, you won't be happy when your happiness is based on your circumstances. You won't be happy when it's based upon the circumstances of life. See, in, in verse 3, the, the psalmist assumes that life goes through seasons. That there are seasons of spring and seasons of summer where things in your life are blossoming. Things in your life are, are picture perfect. They're, everything is just so easy. Everything is so joyful and enjoyable. But then there are other seasons, seasons of winter, where the environment in your life becomes much more harsh, much more difficult. Some type of crisis occurs and it's, it's very harsh. It's very, very hard to go through. And the point I want to make to you, though, is, is that just as the earth goes through different seasons over time, we too will go through different seasons of life. And typically, we don't get to choose which season that is, do we? In other words, our, our circumstances will change. They'll change, right? Right now, you may be in a season that is fun, that is enjoyable. Praise God. I hope you enjoy that season of your life. But just understand that there may be another season that is extremely harsh, extremely difficult, and it's right around the corner waiting for you. In fact, I bet some of you are there right now, aren't you? You're there. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Maybe, maybe you lost your job. Maybe you're struggling right now financially. It's bringing a ton of stress in your life. And it's still in your joy. Maybe you've, you've recently lost a loved one and, and you're having a hard time coping with that and moving on. Maybe you're, maybe you're battling some health-related issue or there's an addiction in your life that you can't seem to shake or there, there's some type of unresolved conflict in your marriage or your family or some loved one. Whatever the case may be, life is hard for you right now and I don't want to gloss over that. However, what I do want you to understand is that if you base your happiness solely on circumstances, then happiness will be elusive. It'll be elusive. You'll, you'll seek to attain it, but you will never grasp it. Your circumstances change. Yes, in the spring and in the summer seasons of life, you may feel as if, oh, I got it, I got it, I got it. But when winter comes... And when difficulty arises, happiness will flee from your life. And that's exactly why you cannot find sustaining joy in your circumstances. Do you see that? Do you, do you understand that the roots of your circumstances are too shallow? They're not, they're not rooted deeply enough. They may keep you standing when your life is filled with rainbows and butterflies. Okay, but when the storms of life come your way, when the wind howls, it's going to knock you down. It's going to take your happiness with it. So don't rely on your circumstances to give you joy. And don't let the season of life you're in right now dictate whether or not you feel happy or blessed. Don't find joy in your circumstances. They're going to change. And then secondly, secondly, you won't be happy. Not only when... You base it on your circumstances, but you won't be happy when you have no anchor point outside of yourself. No anchor point outside of yourself. The, the psalmist describes the, the happy man like a tree with deep roots anchoring him. And this attacks one of our cultural myths head on. It's the belief that happiness comes from freedom. It's the belief that, that you'll be happy when you answer to no one. The belief that, that, that when you're able to define your own rules and you're free to de define your own meaning in life, then you'll be happy. In his writing, C.S. Lewis compared this to a fish that decides he wants to be free by escaping the confines of the water. And so the fish jumps out of the water. He flops onto the land and it's true that the fish is now free from the confines of the water. But is he happier there? Of course not. Why? Because the fish was made for water and you and I are made for God. See, a tree without roots is tumbleweed. Tumbleweed. Tumbleweed, yeah, it's freer than a tree, but is it happier than a tree? 
Look at how the psalmist unpacks this beginning in verse 4. He says, the wicked are not like this. He's talking about the believer, the firmly rooted believer, the tree, the anchor point. Instead, he says, they are like chaff, like chaff that the wind blows away here and then gone. See, if you are not anchored into something outside of yourself, then there comes a point in your life in which you will vanish. You're going to be forgotten. Nothing you did in life mattered. Like chaff, you're going to be blown away. And someone who is only anchored in themselves and their own freedom is going to reach a point where they feel as if life has no real meaning, no lasting value, no good answers as to why they feel the way that they do, that, that nothing will, will come from them after, that, after they die. And listen, when you begin to look at your life in that way, an incredible amount of despair will begin to just fill your heart, fill your soul. Uh, I recently came across a book where the author, who to my knowledge is, is not a believer, he, he talked about this in his own life, the, the despair that he felt that he felt when he was confronted with this very same reality. Listen to what he says. He says this. He says, something strange began to happen to me at age 50. I had a wife who loved me and who I loved. I had a large estate which, without much effort on my part, increased. My name was respected. I had good physical health, and yet I could not live because of death. The question which brought me to the verge of suicide sought an answer with which no one cannot really live. Here it is. Is there any meaning in life that my inevitable death does not destroy? Today or tomorrow, death will come to those I love and then to me. And soon, not only will I not exist, but eventually, no one who exists will remember anything I have ever written or done. So why then go on with the effort? What is it all for? What does it all leave to? What difference does it make whether or not I do this thing or that thing or nothing at all? And he closes by saying, for a time, it is possible to live intoxicated with life, but as soon as one is sober, it is impossible not to see that life in the face of death is a fraud. How often I have been told, oh, you cannot understand the meaning of life, so don't think about it, just live, but I can no longer do that. And I must find an answer to these questions that have filled my life with such despair. Friend, if your life has no anchor point outside of itself, then it's like chaff. It has no real value, no real substance, no real meaning, and it will be easily carried away. But the psalmist continues in verse 5. Notice what he says there. He goes on to say that the wicked will not stand up in the judgment, nor will they be in the assembly of the, of the righteous. In other words, none of them will you feel as if life has no meaning, but even worse, you'll be judged by God. You'll be declared guilty because of your sins, and you'll be sent to the gates of hell and be forever banished from the presence of the Lord in righteousness. And the Bible is clear on this, right? The Bible says that it is appointed unto man once to die, and after that, the judgment. And at the end of my life and at the end of your life, every single one of us will stand before Almighty God and we're either going to hear the word condemned or forgiven. Which one will be true for you? For those who walk with God, for those who are found in Christ, they will be forgiven. But those who reject Him, those who find no anchor point in Him but only in themselves, in this life alone, will be condemned. And listen, I know that some of you here this morning, you don't want to hear any of that. But deep down, you know it's true. You know it's true. Jesus said, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world, to live the life that you want to live, to seek pleasure in all the wrong places, to pursue happiness and joy based upon what the world offers you, but then in the end, lose it all, forfeit your soul, and be eternally condemned by God. What good is that? How, how does living that type of life profit you in any type of way? It is impossible for you to experience real lasting happiness, and it's impossible for you to experience real lasting joy when you live your life in those terms. And so the psalmist says here, he says, open your eyes to these things. Come to your senses. Realize that this type of life will never fully give you what your heart yearns for. 
and what your soul craves. Instead, realize that there is another way that you can live your life. That there's another pathway that's been laid out for you. And that if you follow that pathway, embrace that pathway, that you can experience that never-ending, never-ceasing, abundant joy that endures in all seasons of life. And that when this life is over, you're going to receive an eternal, heavenly, everlasting joy in glory. And you see, this is the path. This is the, this is the key that unlocks the box to your inner joy in your outward happiness. And it's not the key of your circumstances, so don't try to find your lasting joy there. And it's not the key of your freedom to do as you please, so don't try to find your joy there. No, it's the key of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it will unlock the meaning of your life, the value of your life, the purpose of your life, and will in turn give you a never-ending supply of happiness and joy. Look at how the psalmist describes that beginning in verse 1. I'll read it over again. He he says, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked. Advice, counsel. He's he's talking about the way you think. He says, Or stand in the pathway with sinners. That's a reference to how you behave, how you live your life. Or or sit in the company of mockers uh, in Jewish culture where you sat, where you sat, showed where you belonged. Men sat with men, women sat with women, the rich sat with the rich, the poor sat with the poor, and so on and so on. He's he's talking about where you find your identity. So what he's saying here, he's saying, let your mind, let your behaviors, and let your identity be shaped by the Word of God. He's saying in order to feel happy and satisfied and fulfilled, trying to be a good person is not good enough. Being religious, it's not enough. Coming to church, it's not enough. No, in order to experience true, lasting joy and true, lasting happiness, you have to drive the roots of your soul deep into the gospel so that your thinking, so that your actions and your identity, they're all shaped by it. In other words, the gospel must become an anchor for your soul where its roots grow so deep that whatever season of life you're in right now, whether it be winters of loneliness or droughts of depression or storms of temptation, you are still standing and you can confidently say, it is well with my soul. Listen to me, there is nothing on earth that's going to satisfy your deepest needs like the, like the gospel. Nothing. Nothing. Yes, your life and your circumstances, they may be enjoyable and pleasant right now, but when the storms of life come crashing on your door, only the gospel can keep you upright and steadfast. Only the hope that is found in Christ can carry you through that season and give you a peace and a joy in the midst of your storm. Your circumstances are going to let you down. Your freedom to do as you want may be enjoyable for a time, but it will let you down Jesus, by contrast, will never let you down. And so if you embrace Him, if you walk with God, if you invite His Spirit to be the anchor in your life, you can experience happiness and joy in any season because you are a child of God and you are an heir to His kingdom. So the psalmist says the secret of happiness is found in driving your roots deep into the gospel. And in light of that, some of you need to get a lot more serious about two things. That if, if that's true, and based upon this psalm it is, there, there are two things that we need to get a lot more serious about. Number one, you need to get a lot more serious about the Word of God. A lot more serious about the Word. And notice what the psalm says in verse 2. He says that, that those who are happy and blessed, listen to this, they delight in the Lord's instruction, the Word of God. They meditate on it day and night. The happy man does not approach the Word of God as some duty or some chore, but they find their delight in it. The happy man does not rush through and quickly read the Word of God just so they can check off some spiritual box 
They meditate on the Word of God day and night. You know, when I, when I first fell in love with, when I first fell in love with Victoria, it was not a duty or a chore to think about her. Okay, when I got the opportunity to, to talk to her on the phone or, or meet with her in person, my mind wasn't thinking, how much longer do I got to do this? I don't want to be here. I'm ready to, I'm ready to go do something else. No, she was where my mind went to day and night. And I can promise you this, it wasn't a duty or a chore then, and it's not a duty or a chore now. Why? Because I love her. Why? Because, because I enjoy spending time with her. It brings me joy. It brings me delight. So, and so the point is that just as a, as a loved one brings us joy and we find delight by being in their presence, we should find an even greater joy and a more intimate delight by being in the presence of God. And spending time with him and his word. And, and listen, I know that upon hearing that, some of you are thinking, well, well, yeah, that's easy to say, but impossible to live out. But perhaps it feels impossible to you because you don't spend any time with God other than what you do on Sunday. And yes, I'm glad you're here. Yes, I'm, I'm glad you brought your Bible. But would you only spend time in the word in your Sunday school class and in the sermon, you will not find lasting delight in the word of God. And perhaps that's one of the reasons why your spiritual life feels, feels stale right now. Perhaps that's one of the reasons why you feel so unsatisfied and discontent because you're not found in the Word of God. Listen, you were made to worship God and the, and the Word of God was made for you. It, it is the living, breathing words of God. So seek to spend time in something like that of real value to find delight in that, and then it says, meditate on it. Meditate on it, as verse 2 says. In fact, the Hebrew word for meditate, if you were to, to literally take that word and define it, it literally means to mumble to yourself. Mumble. That's what it means. Mumble the word of God. I know it sounds crazy, but just kind of thinking, you know, in, in reflecting on what, what you read. Mumbling on the Word of God, mumbling the gospel over and over again in your mind as you go throughout your day. I, I, heard, a, I heard a pastor compare this to how a, a cha, a, how a cow chews cud. How a cow chews cud. A, a cow wakes up in the morning, eats some grass, and then takes a nap, right? And then after the nap, he, he wakes up, he regurgitates the grass that he ate, he chews on it a little bit more in his mouth, extracting even more nutrients. And then he takes another nap. And then he wakes up and regurgitates it again. And he continues that process over and over again until all the nutrients are gone. Now listen, I know that, it, that may not be the most appetizing thing to think about before lunchtime. But I think it's a great analogy of how we ought to read our Bibles. You, <laughs> write this down. Read your Bible... Like a cow chews cut. <laughs> That's what you should do. You should meditate on it day and night. Mumbling the word of God so that it will begin to, to deeply impress upon you. And you'll, you'll memorize it. Yet you'll extract the nutrients that are found within its pages. And that when you do these things, you will begin to find delight in the word of God. The Lord's instruction as the psalmist says. Okay, so you, you got to get a lot more serious about the Word. The Word of God, finding delight in the Word of God. And then number two, number two, and we'll close on this. Number two, you, you got to get a lot more serious about the church. The Word and now the church. Notice verse one again. It says, How happy is the one who does not walk in the advice of the wicked, who does not stand in the pathway of sinners, and who does not sit in the company of mockers. In other words, one way that will lead you to find true happiness is to surround yourself with like-minded people who will encourage you, support you, pray for you, and point you towards the Word of God and towards Christ. Listen, sermons may inspire you. I hope that they do. But it's your community that shapes you. 
Sermons are good, but, but community is, is really where you will be shaped into the man and woman of God. Someone once famously said this, said, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Well, just let that sink in for a moment. That if, that if you want to know what you're going to be like in the future, then look at your friends right now in the present. You, your friends are your future you. Adults, are you surrounding yourself with people of God who encourage you and inspire you in your walk with the Lord to grow? Are you surrounding yourself with that? Students, are your, are your friend groups, are they leading you closer to the Lord or further away from Him? Parents, are you making sure that your child is actively involved and engaged in the ministries of the church or do ball games and other events take top priority in their lives and your life too? Listen to me here. The church should not be an event you attend occasionally on weekends. It should be your community. Listen to me here. Your deepest and best relationships, I believe, should be found in the church. Found right here. Not because we're a bunch of perfect people, but because we are a church that represents the body of God who wants to pursue the likeness of Christ. And we are committed to helping each other along the way. And you ought to have deep, firmly rooted relationships where you have people who are like-minded and people who want to go down that path too and inspire you and encourage you and point you to the Word of God. Okay, and so if, you, if you're not already plugged into some type of, of small group, whether that's Sunday school or a life group or a, or a Wednesday night Bible study, make a point to get connected to one. And I promise you this, I promise you that over time, that group, whoever it is, will begin to encourage you and support you and pray for you and invest in you and ultimately point you towards the source of all happiness and delight, and that is the Word of God and the Gospel. So, friend, do you want to be happy? Do you want to be happy? Then devote yourself to the Word of God and the people of God. That's where you find it. Psalm 1611 says this, it says, in your presence is the fullness of joy. At your right hand is are our pleasures forevermore. And fullness of joy means joy that cannot be any greater. Pleasures forevermore means joy that's, that's never ending. The greatest joy that lasts for eternity is found in God. And I know that because I, I've tasted just a small piece of it. Not even that much, but, I, but I've tasted it. But also know this, that you will only taste that when you dive yourselves into it head first. And you completely go into the Word of God and press into what it says. Charles Spurgeon once said this. He says, the half-committed Christian is the most miserable person on earth. Think about that. That the, that the half-committed Christian is the most miserable person on earth. This is what he means by that. He says, he's just enough in the world to be miserable in the presence of God. He's just enough into God to be miserable in the world. If you want to be happy, if you want to be satisfied, if you want to be fulfilled in any and every season of life, then drive your roots deep into the gospel. And get serious about the word of God. Get serious about surrounding yourself with the people of God so that those things can, together can bring you joy. Would you bow your heads with me as we close? Father, we thank you, God, for God, this reminder, God, that, that our joy and our happiness, God, it's not found in our circumstances. Because circumstances change. They're fleeting. They're this and then they're that. And there are some seasons, God, where it's, it seems to be very easy. Things come into place just as we hope that they would, but Father, there are other seasons that are extremely difficult. And God, if we try to find and, and base upon our, our joy in those things, God, then happiness and joy will be a thing that is ever elusive. We'll never grasp it, so help us to not find it in that. And Father, help us to, to not find it, God, in, in the freedom that we have, in, in the anchor point of, of ourself, of doing things that we want to do and living the life that we want to live. Father, that may be fun for a time, but God, there comes a point in our lives where we realize that if this is all there is, then life really is meaningless. That life really has no value. 
That once we're gone, we are forever forgotten and that like chaff we're blown away. God, help us to be found in your word. Help us to be found in the roots of the gospel. Help that to be the root of our life. God, so that when the seasons of difficulty come our way, God, we can remain firm. We can even be joyful in difficult times. As Paul talks about in his own letters, God, that we would find joy not in our circumstances, but we would found it in you. Knowing that the gospel is true in our lives, knowing that we're promised so many great things because of your son, Jesus. And so, friend, do you find joy and happiness in your life? If not, could it be because of these things? Could it be because you have not committed yourself to the word of God and the people of God? Has the gospel taken root in your life? Does the word of God, is that the anchor point in your soul? Do you find delight in it? Do you meditate on it day and night? And maybe you say, Jeremy, I, I want to feel that, but I don't. And listen, if that's you, I understand. I felt that too. But I'm just asking that if that is you, then, then just confess that to God right now. And pray that, that God would reignite that flame and that passion and that desire in your life. That you would find joy in Him. That you'd want to do these things. That you would pursue these things. That you would surround yourself with other believers to encourage you. That you would get plugged into a small group. Maybe you aren't happy because you haven't received the joy of Christ. And listen, if that's you and, and you and you realize that today, then I want you to know that the greatest thing that you can do is right now in this very moment inviting Him into your life to receive that everlasting joy that comes through Him, comes through the sacrifice that He made for your sins on the cross, that He defeated death once and for all, so that if you believe in Him, you may not be condemned but will receive eternal life. Where do you find your happiness? Where do you find your joy? Help us to be reminded, Father, that we find it in you and you alone. God, if we're not finding it in you, God, help us to repent of that right now. And God, help us to commit ourselves to you. And God, if we've not trusted you as Savior and Lord, Father, I pray that we would make that wrong right right now as I say these words, inviting you into our lives. God, I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand as we close?
my soul. Oh, don't, don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. Cause you got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me, lift up your soul. It's uh, just another way that we can be thankful and just be remembering of how blessed we are and how thankful we should be and how much we should praise the Lord in any and all season of life. Uh, I want to again remind you about the opportunity that you have to support our local families through the angel tree. Please know that the last day to give towards those families is today. And so if you are uh, not been able to give yet or if you're on the fence about that, I'm just going to press on you to, to follow through with that and know that your money is going to be uh, put to great use and be a blessing for families in our community. Uh, and I also want to remind you of this as well. It was not in the bulletin, and I want to make sure I announce it, but next Sunday. Is that right, Shelly? Next Sunday? Okay. Making sure I got that right. Next Sunday is going to be our big holiday meal uh, after the service. And so we would uh, invite all of you to bring a dish for that uh, and to enjoy that after our service. Again, that will immediately follow next Sunday service in the FLC. And so keep that on your radar. Be thinking about what dish you want to bring. Uh, and that will always be a good time. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us today. Uh, I hope you've had a great time uh, in Sunday school and corporately in the sanctuary as we've worshipped him through song and through the reading and study of his word. Johnny Thompson, would you close us and you'll be dismissed. Thank you all for joining us today.